you'll look at Luke 22, 19. I want to, I want to talk about that verse this morning. And if you take notes, I've entitled the message, the most important thing to remember, the most important thing to remember, Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave them saying, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Since we had our Lord's Supper, um, I decided, or I didn't really decide, I was led to use this text. And to expand on it a little bit, because when we have our supper every month, it's a short time, and there's so much involved in the Lord's Supper. Before we look at this verse, though, let's, uh, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten us. We come to you, Spirit of God, in thanksgiving that we have 66 books, all inspired by God and all the truth about every facet of life. And as we look at this one book, that deals with the Lord's sacrifice and us remembering that sacrifice. We pray you'll open up our minds and our hearts. And if there's one listening, Lord, who knows not Christ as Savior, we do pray you might stir that heart or even call them. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was coming in this morning thinking about the message, the thought crossed my mind. The most important thing any human being can do is remember Jesus Christ. And then my mind said, well, why is that? And it answered itself. And it said, because he he's going to remember you. He's going to remember what you did and what you didn't do. That's why remembering Jesus Christ is the most important thing a believing Christian can do, and it's the most important thing an unsafe person can do. Because without remembering Christ and thinking of Christ and being in Christ and receiving Christ without any of that, you have no hope of anything in this world or the world to come. Do this in remembrance of me. Those words mean more than just what they say. And that's what I want to look at. Now, the Lord's Supper is, is one of two ordinances that, that the Lord ordained that his people would practice. Uh, it was the Lord's Supper and, of course, baptism. And it's a command to use the elements of a meal, a meal, to memorialize Jesus. And it's difficult to understand uh, it's difficult for me to understand why, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, we would have to be reminded to remember him. Especially when you think about some of the things I said earlier, when you consider who he was, what he did, when you consider the price that he paid for you and his people. And all the benefits, when you consider all the benefits that come from your relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, almost all the books in the, in the in 66 books in the Bible, except for Esther and Song of Solomon, have either a direct or an indirect reference to Jesus Christ. The New Testament itself has 89 chapters dedicated to the history of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ was by far, not even worth mentioning anybody, anybody else, he was by far the most unforgettable man that ever walked this earth. So how can a Christian, how can somebody who calls themselves a Christian ever forget their crucified Savior? The answer is really simple. Sin. Sin. In the command to remember me, Understand this, Jesus isn't just referring, he's not just referring to the memory of him, he's also illustrating the power of sin. You see, man's fall from grace in Eden was so severe that it affected his memory. Now, a lot of people think that man didn't wasn't completely uh, didn't completely fall from grace. He had a little knowledge. He could make his choices for God or not. He could do all that. Some people believe that 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 stuff. It's not true though. 
When man fell from grace, he was so severely impacted, it impacted not just his relationship with God, not just his relationship with the world that he was in, it impacted his memory as well. And we know that's true because some people suffer traumatically and they suffer memory problems from that trauma. Although our soul, speaking to the believers, our soul and our spirit have been regenerated for a new creature in Christ, our flesh is not regenerated, has not been regenerated. So we can be tempted by the lust of the flesh and the desires of our heart. We can be tempted. We are tempted almost every day. Not to mention the desires of our heart being the, the big one. Romans 7.25 backs that up. So with the, then with the, mind, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. We all do it. Now just think about this. If we were completely regenerated, our focus would only be on the Lord. Did you know that? And proof of that is seen in Genesis 1 and 2. Before the fall, Adam, his whole focus was on tending God's garden. He didn't send him out in the world and say, go out there and do this. And he just said, I'll give you a garden, give you all you need, stay away from the tree, and just, and just love me. Do my garden. And then every day, he walked with him in the cool of the day. So his focus was always on God. But when sin entered, when, when his wife came up to him and told him about the, the forbidden fruit, and he took that bite, whatever it was, he took that bite, that's when man's flesh was born. That's when it was born in sin. Now his thoughts were divided between what God wanted and what he wanted. That's how it started. And now God had to compete. He had to compete with the world and man's desires. From the fall to this very hour, man's flesh takes his mind away from God and he must be reminded to remember to remember God. Man's memory of God is so bad, the words remember, listen to this, the words remember or, rem or remembrance are used over 350 times in the Bible. That's how bad it is. There's only one command in there that, that has more, uh, that there's more of a command, there's more words used in that command, and that is fear not. Fear not has 365, remember or remembrance has 350. Now, when God uses something that much, what does that tell you? If you were writing something and you use the same words over and over and over, what would you be doing? You'd be reiterating a point. Why? You want your reader to get the, the message. Do you get the message? Do you get the message to remember Christ? Remember him not just at this table. Remember him not just in your prayers. Remember him in those dark times when, he, when you're by yourself and you're lamenting over something. Remember him. And whatever's happening to you, think about what happened to him. Remember him. There's no crisis you'll ever have that he, that he can't understand. He had the greatest of all crises. He had man's sin. There's no greater Christ. And he knew it. The sinless, perfect man knew that he was going to get all of our sins. And he did it. Imagine that. Imagine knowing the future. Knowing what's going to go, what you're going to suffer, what you're going to go through. And still having the stomach to do it. That's how much he loves you, Donna. That's how much he loves you, uh, Wink. Didn't he? That much. He knew what it was going to be like, and he did it anyway. Remember me. And that's his command. Remember me. That should give you an idea of just how badly man's memory was damaged when he fell from grace. I'd also let you know, uh, also note 
that remember me is addressed specifically to Christ's disciples. This table belongs to Christ's disciples. It's reserved for them alone. Those who are hostile to God have no business at this table. They can't eat. They can eat from it, but it does nothing for them. They can't celebrate anything because they're hostile to him. It's reserved for his people. To me, to me personally, it seems strange that Jesus would have to command us to remember him considering, or his disciples, I'm talking about his uh, 12 disciples, considering what they saw him do. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him heal the blind, give sight to the blind. They saw him give legs to the lame, raise the dead. They saw him do all of that. And yet, he tells them, remember me. And these are people that live with him for three years, three and a half years. Is it possible, do you think, is it possible that we can forget him who loves us and even died for us? Is that possible, really? You know what? It's not only possible. It's a sad fact that Jesus Christ is not the main focus in many Christians' lives. He's not. Each day we go through, we face problems, we face the world, we face spiritual warfare, and we face most uh, fatigue, and most of all, we face ourselves, the worst enemy. And all of those things combined work together to steal our attention away from Jesus Christ. And many, many Christians allow it to happen. If we're honest, there are blocks of time in all of our lives when we not only don't remember him, but just as importantly, we don't call on him. And for those who would say, well, we, you know, we need to deal with life. It's uh, situations of life. We have to go to work. We have, don't we have to do that? The answer is absolutely yes, you do. You must deal with life as Christ's disciples. You're supposed to but you're supposed to deal with life and take him with you. You're supposed to be holding his hand. You're supposed to be walking with God through everything, every facet of your life. Proof first, you all know it. Jerry, you know this one real good. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he'll guide your, he'll direct your paths. You have to deal with it. We forget them. And I would remind you, there's a reason why God told us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. There's a reason. And that reason is in Mark 12, 30. He commands us to remember, uh, remember me. That means to remember to keep your focus on me, not on yourself. That's another, that's another reason why he says, remember me. Remember me when you're going through all that stuff. Don't look at yourself. Every We talked about it at a Bible study this morning. Every single time something comes up, we push our own buttons. We get angry over other people saying things and doing things that aren't true. And if they are true, it doesn't matter. You just say, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that I did that. Or even if I did, please forgive me and ask him for forgiveness, and then turn around right in front of him and say, Lord, I sinned against John, but not only did I sin against John, I first sinned against you because I took something from him that I shouldn't have taken. God, forgive me in Jesus' name. I'm done. I went to the man, made it right, and I went to my God. It's that simple. Nobody can push your button if you understand those principles. How do I put that in my book? The principle of button pushing. <laughs> and remember me also means you're not alone in this life. Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. If you looked at this and you highlighted there's five promises in that one verse. Fear not. First one, I am with you. Be not dismayed. Second one, I am your God. 
I will strengthen you. You, yes, I will help you. Another promise. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Five promises in one verse. You're never alone. You're not going through anything alone. It's all up here. If you keep your focus on Christ, point is, he'll help you deal with life's adversities. And you know that. But you have to remember him. And it doesn't matter what the problem is. Some people think, oh, my problem is this one. Listen, you don't have a problem that he can't figure out. How about that? You don't have a problem. You're commanded to let God be a part of every single problem in your life. You're commanded to do it. And the command is in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, but, but in all things, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You're commanded to bring him into all aspects of your life. You got to remember him. You got to remember to bring him in, not just at the table. If you're just remembering him here, you're really missing the boat. By putting Jesus Christ in front of your day and keeping him there, that's, that's one of the best ways to remember him. Not only are you thinking of him in your prayers, but you're thinking of him in your tears. You're thinking of him, you're thinking of him on those forsaken nights or those dark nights. You're thinking of him when hope is thin because of fear. Remember him. Bring him into every part of your life. Also note, Jesus used a meal. Isn't that interesting? He used a meal to memorialize the new covenant in his blood. You know why? Because most people eat three times a day. So he figures, remember me, at least three times a day. How about that? And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave that unto them, saying, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. The message in that text is that Christ is God's sacrificial lamb, and he's the new Passover meal for mankind. That's the other part of it. He was issuing, um, not issuing, he was bringing in a new covenant. The old covenant, the Old Testament, by the way, the, the word testament means covenant. It means an agreement. It means agreement between two parties. And he was, he was taking the Old Testament, which was a shadow of the New Testament, and the blood of Jesus Christ that we just talked about at this table was ushering in that new covenant, and he was using the meal to, as, a, as a, uh, a metaphor for his body on the cross and the wine for his blood. That's what it's about. Jesus was, uh, was telling the world with this ordinance he was ushering in a new covenant with man, a brand new one. So forget about Egypt. That's what he was telling them. Forget about the old Passover meal. Forget about the blood on the doorframe to ward off the death angel. Forget about animal sacrifices. These things were only a shadow of things to come. Forget about them all. There's a new covenant now. God has become incarnate to claim you and you and you as his own. So remember him. You remember him because the Holy Lamb of God poured out his blood on the beams of Calvary. He did that. Not only to ward off the death angel, he did that to destroy him forever. There's no, you, there's no victory in death. There's no victory in the grave. Jesus Christ is the answer to all of that. He's solved all of those things we never die we transfer from one realm to another realm death is the vehicle we use that's all it is your body perishes it has to perish blood uh flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of god paul tells us that in romans 5 i mean in first uh, corinthians 15 so the body perishes but the soul and the spirit is more alive when it's when it passes through into the eternal realm than it ever was in this world it's more alive there's no death death has to do with your body not your soul and what is your soul your soul is your intellect your thoughts and your memories and when you transfer into this world 
uh, into the eternal world, rather. And you do it, and, you, and, you, and you're in heaven. All those negative thoughts you had, all those terrible things that happened to you, all of them are gone. You have a new, better understanding. And you're more alive then than you'll ever be here. More alive here. Or there, rather. Now the children of light, us, there's no sting to our death. None. There should be no sting to death. There should be no fear of death. Because there is no death. It's the death of the body. Now the children of obedience have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. You're being transferred. That's it. Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. On the night of his death, Jesus replaced the Passover meal with the Lord's Supper. He did that. He used bread and wine because they are the perfect symbols of life and of death. The bread represented the body, that which would be put to death, broken, so you and I would have eternal life. That's the purpose of it. And the wine symbolized his blood, his death. What was that for? The forgiveness of sins. See, the plan is so perfect. God, it, God is perfect in everything. And the plan was absolutely perfect. He cannot claim a people, a sinful people with their sins. So he sent his son on that cross to pay for your sins and your sins and your sins and your sins. That was the whole purpose of it. So now, I have a standing before God, a standing, a spiritual standing of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God. That's a standing. doesn't mean I'm perfect now. It means that I have a standing in heaven that's perfect. Because of his sacrifice, his blood. In the last few words of our text, we get the key purpose for the, on the Lord's Supper. Do this and remember to me. That's the key words to the whole thing. The Supper, of course, as I said before, is a celebratory uh, feast, a time to celebrate the new covenant in our Lord's blood. It's a time when, our, when Christ's disciples should gather around his table. It's a time to forget about your pains. It's a time to forget about struggles and heartaches, your family, financial cares. It's a time to forget about everything. When you come to that table, you should forget about everything and just have your focus on Jesus Christ. That's what coming to the communion table is all about. It's about remembering Jesus Christ, our Savior King. And at the same time, it's, it's a remembrance of me is also a recall from ourselves. It's a time when we take our eyes off ourselves, which we like to keep on a little more than we should, and we put away our unbelief and we get back to our first love, Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. The Lord's command to remember me is also a call to remember what his blood did for you. I mentioned some of it before. You're justified by that blood, Romans 5.1. We have forgiveness of sins, Colossians 2, 13 and 14. We have access to God, Ephesians 2, 18. We have the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5, 22, 23. We've been freed from the bondage of sin, Romans 6, 14. We have, we have, we have the blessings of Jesus Christ go on and on. We have them all. Do this in remembrance of me. Got to remember it. Not just him, but what he did. That's what worshiping God is. That's how you worship God every day. You take him home. You take him to work. You take him to the grocery store. I've told this story a hundred times. I pray for bananas, and they're sweeter when I pray for them. And when I don't pray for them, they're not as sweet. I'm telling you that. Pray for everything. And when you do that, every prayer, at the end of every prayer is what? Jesus' name. And that's what you're doing. You're remembering him. That's what prayer does. It, it helps you to remember him by using him in every part of your life. 
I think what you ought to do, it just came to me, you ought to, you ought to go home when you leave here, make a note this week. I want to think of how many times I remember Jesus Christ in my life. Do it, but just take a notebook at the end of the day. It said, I don't know, I prayed 12 times today. I used Jesus' name. What else did I do? Think about that. And if at the end of a week you look at that, or three days or two days, you look at that and you say, wow, that's it? Then do something about it. And if you look at that and you see the list is this big, thank you, Lord. Keep it up. Don't stop. That's how you do it. See, that's what a relationship is all about. It's about checks and balances and examining yourself. And when you're not where you're supposed to be, you make adjustments in your life to get where you need to be. And remembering him is the best standard to use for everything. doesn't matter what it is. doesn't matter. For these reasons and many, many more, our text <clears throat> is a command to remember me. Now, how about for you people that don't sit at the table that might be listening? What blessings do you enjoy, do you enjoy rather, at the spiritual com uh, communion table that you sit at? Because whether you're saved, if you're not saved, I should say, you're still a spiritual creature. You still, you just are disconnected from God. So how are, how is that going for you? How are the blessings you're receiving from that spiritual table? Oh, by the way, just so you know this, there's only two spiritual tables you can sit at. You're either going to sit at the, at the table with Christ, or you're going to sit at the table with Satan. It's that simple. John 8, 44, Jesus said to those people who claim to believe in him, I think it's in verse 33 or somewhere in that area. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and it is his will you want to do. And what he was really saying to these so-called followers was he was saying, I'm not your, you have nothing to do with me. Your father is the devil. Why? Because you don't love me enough to do what I tell you. That's ultimately what he was saying. You're trying, and after it showed up that he was trying to kill him. They were trying to kill him after he, le after he left uh, or at the end of that, that text. So the point is there's two tables. Where are you sitting? If you're sitting with the devil, and you're not eating at Christ's table, you're dining. That's something I like to call the Brimstone Cafe. The Brimstone Cafe is where all people that are not saved dine spiritually. Which means, whether you believe it or not, or like it or not, when your dinner is over, you have reservations for the lake. The lake of fire. How do you feel about that if you're listening to this and you don't, you couldn't come to the table because you don't know Christ as your as Savior or you're listening online? How does this feel to eat at the Brimstone Cafe knowing when your dinner is over, this life is over, you got reservations at the lake and you don't need to bring a blanket. If you bring anything, try to bring a bottle of water. That's it. How does that make you feel? And even as us as believers, do you imagine that? At the time, when before we were saved, we wouldn't believe that. If God is stirring your heart, and you want to get out of that restaurant, and you want to eat at this table, the Lord's table, you call or see me. Because all you have to do is you just have to realize that you're a sinner, you have to repent of that sin, and you have to ask God to forgive you. How hard is that? And if you don't do it, and you just and you heard what I just said to you, and the sacrifice is there in Christ, you'll be forgiven of all your sins. Then it means if you don't come to that table, it's not that it's not that you can't. It's not that anything other than I love my sin more than I love that table, and that's really what it boils down to. And if that's you, know this. You may not believe this. You may not like this. You may not even want to think about this. But the spiritual fact is that if you don't, if you die in your sins and you don't come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you don't make the simple confession to him of your sins and ask him to forgive you and you do it with the right heart, if you don't do that, then guess what? You're eating in the right place. The, the, the uh, Brimstone Cafe, you're eating in the right place because you don't want to give up your sins. If that's but if you have if you're feeling if your heart is being stirred and you feel like you don't want to you don't like the fare there, you want something different. 
Do I need at this table? You call or see me, and I'll show you in his word how he's stirring you to come to know his son as uh, God stirring you to come to know his son as Savior. And in doing that, you don't have to worry about going to the lake. Instead, he'll take you to paradise, a paradise you can't even imagine. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the new covenant, the new testament in Christ's blood has changed your life. Right? Changed your life. So go home and remember Jesus gave up his life so you would have a new life here now and you would also have an eternal life with him forever. Take that thought home. And next week, put the command, remember me into every facet of your life. And then buckle up and watch what God's going to do for you.